Welcome back to MS1016. And in this lecture, we will be examining the first law of thermodynamics. Okay, let's start our discussion by talking a little bit about what systems are. Now, a system is described as any part of a physical universe of which we are interested in. And that can be many different things. A lump of metal, a piece of plastic, a beaker of water. It is then separated, okay, if we assume the rock is a system, all right, so let's call this the system, all right, it is separated from the rest of the universe by a boundary. This can be either real or imaginary, all right, and a system can be described as either closed or open. Now, the entire universe can be a system in itself. So, for instance, if you take the universe as a system, the matter in that system will contain all of the universe's particles, such as all its atoms, its molecules, and these particles are always in continuous motion as of now, and interacting with one another. In a closed system, say for instance here, the rock, no matter enters or leaves and stays within its boundary or rather, it cannot exceed its boundary easily. So, I just talked a little bit about what exactly is a surrounding, what exactly is a system. A system is separated from its surroundings by a boundary. Okay, Everything else other than the system is its surrounding. And in a system, we usually do not notice the atomic motion and we can only sense something known as macroscopic properties. Macroscopic properties are things we can observe, things like temperature, pressure, composition, volume, and energy. We cannot observe things such as molecular motion. Hence, those are not macroscopic properties. Now, what is not a macroscopic property it would essentially be a system's microstate. That is in opposition to a macrostate. The microstate of a system would consist of a list describing of the velocities and positions of all the atoms and molecules in a system. What does that mean? Consider this system over here. Okay, I'm just going to label this as a system. In any system, molecules and atoms and particles are moving all of the time. Say, if I were to freeze time per se, okay, all right, this is frozen time in a system, I would essentially be able to take a snapshot of a list describing all the velocities and positions of all the atoms and molecules at that point in time. As you can understand, such a list would be really, really, really large, even if it was just a very small rock or a small system. So we know what a microstate is. What is a macrostate? In opposition to stuff we cannot observe, a macrostate is something we can observe and we can measure. We can measure the macrostate of a system through multiple instruments. For instance, we can measure a system's pressure, temperature, volume, and number of moles, or we, at least we can calculate it. This is in opposition to, say, knowing about the position of atoms and molecules at any one point in time. So, what are some variables characterizing a macrostate? As I mentioned in the previous slide, there are things like pressure, volume, amount of a substance, and even its energy. And the macrostate of a system, we call them thermodynamic properties or thermodynamic variables. One thing I need you all to note is that if a system is left undisturbed, macroscopic variables will eventually settle down and no further change will occur. The system is then described to be in equilibrium. 
And this really is the primary concern of all thermodynamics. Fun fact, in case you wanted to know how the universe is going to end, it's most likely going to end in equilibrium. Okay, here's an important concept. Now, if we know the number of moles of a substance, then all we need to do is to know the value of two macroscopic variables to describe an entire macrostate. What does that mean? For instance, okay, we can know a system's pressure if we know the number of moles and the internal energy and its volume. Similarly, we know a system's internal energy if we know the number of moles and can measure its pressure and volume. Also, we can also know the volume of a system if we know the number of moles of a substance, its internal energy, and its pressure. So let's look at, say, for instance, the equation for an ideal gas. Okay, this is an equation for an ideal gas over here. If we know the number of moles in the system, all we have to do is measure its temperature and its volume, and we will know the system's pressure. So here, I want to talk about something known as intensive and extensive properties. What are they? So let's look at it from a point of view of an example. Consider two systems of identical pressure, energy, volumes, and mole numbers separated by a partition over here. All right. If you remove the partition, system 1 and system 2 will combine to become system 3. The energy of system 3 is equal to the combined energy of system 1 and system 2. Volume and energy hence depend on the size of a system. Anything that depends on the size of a system is called an extensive property. Let's consider a converse example. For instance, in the case of pressure. You've got system 1, system 2. Assume that both systems have the same pressure. When you remove the partition, the result is that the pressure does not change. And hence, pressure is not dependent on the size of a system. Something like that is known as an intensive property. Know that if we divide one extensive property by another, the result is an intensive property. For instance, if we divide energy by volume, we will get energy per unit volume, which is something that is not dependent on the size of a system. Now, know that two systems can interact with one another, even though they are separated by a boundary. And in thermodynamics, there are two ways systems can interact with one another, and that is through heat and work. If two systems are exchanging energy with one another and no other systems, the conservation of energy requires that the energy lost by the one system must be equal to the energy gained by the other. And that is what this equation describes. The energy lost by a system will be gained by another. In short, energy transfer takes place only in two ways either by thermal interaction or by mechanical interaction. Hence, heat and work are forms of energy in transit. Consider this example, okay? You've got, say, a burner right here. That's a little flame. And you are trying to heat a beaker of water. The heat here is the energy in transit, which you are converting 
to a mechanical interaction in the beaker of water. Consider another example of a man, all right, pardon my art, assume that he's a blacksmith, all right, that's his apron, and he's hammering a piece of metal. As he's hammering that piece of metal, he is effectively using calories and transmitting energy from himself as a system to mold the second system. Hence, work here is a form of energy transfer. Let's look at this example for thermal interaction. Consider these two systems in a thermally insulating envelope. Okay, thermally insulated. That means system one and system two do not take in or give out heat uh, to its surroundings. Now, we can describe the energy change in system two due to absorption of the amount of heat, Q, all right, no, this term over here, we usually describe heat as Q, and we can describe the interaction as equation 1.2, okay? So Q is the heat absorbed by a system, okay? And we say U is the energy change of a system. When it comes to work, let's consider this example. Here are two systems separated from each other by a freely sliding, thermally insulated piston. Okay, as usual, this is also a thermal envelope. And let's consider that the system doesn't lose heat to and from its surroundings. Now, if the pressure of system 2 exceeds the pressure of system 1, the piston will move to the left and hence, we can say that system 2 is doing work on system 1. And if W is the work done by system 2, then the conservation of energy requires that W is equals to negative delta U because system 2 is actually losing energy in relation to system 1 because it's doing work on system 1. Since we live in the real world, most interactions are a combination of both heat and work. Consider this example at last. When system 2 does work on system 1, it compresses the gas. Okay, so here the pressure in 2 okay, is greater than P in 1 and it compresses the gas which then heats up. And it heats up purely because the particles have less space to move around and hence temperature increases. Hence, if we consider that this over here is now porous and not thermally insulating, heat will flow from system 1 to system 2. We can then describe two interactions here. Okay, Considering from the point of view from system 2, energy is gained by the absorption of heat from system 1. Yet, energy is lost by the system doing work on system 1. Because system 2 is doing work on system 1, the work that system 2 is inverse work and it has generally lost energy.